So we've been talking about the brain, which sits in the skull. But when you look at a person, only, only three pounds of them is their brain, and then you've got the rest of this body. Well, it turns out that the brain is the mission control center. That's where everything is getting directed. That's where the information is coming in and decisions are getting made. And then the rest of the body is just being driven around by the brain. The rest of the body is like a marionette being driven by the brain. There's a bundle of nerves that exits the brain. That's called the spinal cord. Just think about it as a big data cable. It's carrying all the information from your brain, and that data cable goes down, and then there are little smaller cables that, that reach out from, from your back and talk to everything. Talk to every muscle in your body, talk to every internal organ in your body. The whole system is connected by these data cables that end up coming all together and, and feeding the brain. And of course, it's a two-way communication, so the brain is sending data out, causing things to happen, and it's getting feedback. It's finding out what's being felt, what's being seen, heard, all these things are coming back up into the brain. So that's the way to think about it. It's the mission control center that's sitting in its armored bunker and uh, taking in the information from the world, deciding where to go next. Sometimes in neuroscience we, we joke that, uh, that the rest of the body exists just to carry the brain around from place to place, and it's sort of like that. It's, uh, it's, it's like this little operator up there that gets to drive around this giant robot. Now when you look at the human brain, it looks about the same everywhere, but in fact it's not. It's quite specialized and as you move over the different territories of the brain, you find that there are very different things going on. So at the largest level, we have a difference between this part of the brain, which is called the cerebrum, that's the main part of the brain, and then this little part down here, which is called the cerebellum, which stands for little cerebrum. And the cerebrum, this part here, is really where the thinking takes place and the sensory experiences take place. The cerebellum is mostly involved in motor coordination and making your uh, ability to balance and to play the piano and to do fine motor actions. The cerebellum helps with that. But when you think about who you are as a person, that's mostly up here in the cerebrum. Now, the cerebrum looks like it's all the same, but in fact it's not. This is the back of the head that we're looking at, and up here is the front. And it turns out that essentially the back half of the brain, that's where things are taking place in terms of your sensory systems. This is how you get your windows onto the world. You're seeing the world through your eyes, you're hearing it through your ears, you're feeling it through your fingertips, and all of that information comes into the back of the brain here, and that's where that gets processed. The front half of the brain is really more what we associate with the long-term thinking and decision-making and the kinds of choices you make that determine who you are as a person. Most of that happens in the front of the brain. So there's a sense in which the front half is watching what's happening in the back half and making sort of a longer term assessment of what's going on and what to do about that given the information coming in from the outside world here in the back half of the brain. It turns out that different parts of the brain develop at different rates and so um, by the time you're a young child, the parts of your brain involved in understanding sensory information, those have already come into place pretty well. Um, but the parts of your brain in the front that are involved in very long-term decision-making and in squelching impulses in order to make a, lo a better long-term decision, those parts of the brain develop slowly and they don't reach full maturation until the age of about 20 or 21. And this is why, for example, car insurance companies will charge more for young drivers than for adult drivers because adult drivers have a different style of decision making as a result of the development of this part of the brain. And in fact, when we look at the legal system, the same sorts of rules apply. Children are treated very different from adults and it's because children's brains and adult brains really are somewhat different, and it's because of the slow maturation, the slow development of the front part. The outer layer of the brain here is called the cortex, and 
That's Latin for bark. It's like the bark of a tree, and it's very thin. It's only about three millimeters, and it's the wrinkly part that you see on the outside of the brain. Now, why is it wrinkled? It's because humans have a lot of cortex. We have more than most of our cousins in the animal kingdom, and so the only way to fit that all into our small heads is to crumple it up, the way you would fit a newspaper into a smaller container. Okay, now if you were to take the human cortex and, and unravel it and pull it straight, it would be about the size of a medium pizza pie. And, and so there's a lot that's packed in there. If you were to take uh, our nearest cousins, if you were to take uh, a monkey, for example, and unravel its cortex, it's like a personal pan pizza. It's a much smaller bit there, about a quarter of the size. And the cortex is really where all the magic is happening in terms of thinking. Now, below the cortex, there are all sorts of other very important functions happening. These have to do with things like breathing and heartbeat and keeping your temperature straight and letting you know when you're hungry. All sorts of very important things. And we'll talk more about those later. But the cortex, the outer part, is really the magical stuff that determines your ability to think through a problem and make the right sorts of decisions and to sense the world, to have a sensory experience of watching a sunset or, or tasting feta cheese or feeling velvet in your fingertips. These all require the cortex to be in place. So when we zoom in on the details of what's happening in the cortex, you find that different regions are specialized for very particular things. So for example, the back part of the brain here is specialized for vision. So even though your eyes are in the front, that information crosses the entire territory of the brain and ends up being processed in the back of the brain. On the side here is where hearing takes place. This is the, where the information that comes in through your ears actually also goes across the brain and gets, uh, gets processed here in the auditory cortex, as it's called. Along here is the part that processes all the signals from your body. So your skin is one giant sheet of, of sensor material, essentially. And so everything, it, it, it uh, senses touch and vibration and heat, and all that information streams back into your brain, and it's this part of your brain where that's getting processed. And in this intermediate territory, that's where all of those senses come together. And that's why when we experience the world, it's what we call multisensory. It's in that fashion. We don't just see things and hear them and, and touch them separately, but we actually, when we touch things, have a sense of hearing it and feeling it and seeing it all at the same time. It feels like a single unified experience. So you have parts of the cortex that are very specialized, and then all the rest of the cortex is where that information flows together, and we have this multisensory experience of the world.